Welcome, welcome back. I hope you had a good, uh, good session just now. We come to the last of the sessions of the day before we move into some interesting uh, apres ski. But it really gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, my business partner, my colleague, Rob Gardner, well known to all of you. Uh, Rob um, is, is one of the industry heavyweights. He's a pioneer. He's um, put his finger in so many, many pies, it's difficult to, to keep count. But Rob and I worked together back at, uh, back at Merrill, and then we, we left and, and founded Reddington back in 2006. And I mean, Rob has, has advised and has spoken to just about every, just about every pension fund out there over 500 million pounds, I should have thought. I don't think anyone talks to more pension funds than Rob does. He really got his finger on the pulse. And he's the ideal person to, to, to give this next, uh, this next talk. Rob's going to look at pension funds looking back over the last 15 years. Why are we where we are? And what does the next 5, 10, 15 years hold for us? So he's super busy. I don't know how much time he's had to prepare, but uh, his stuff's always good. And I'm looking forward to it. So Rob, thank you. Thanks, Eric. The one thing I asked Eric was not to overcook the intro, so uh, <laughs> lucky he didn't overcook the intro. Uh, so I've got about 35 minutes, and, and, and what I wanted to do was really zoom out uh, and, and, and think about where we are. So I've picked the analogy of our pensions industry being like a massive uh, ocean-going tanker, uh, and I'm going to use the analogy of a, a, the fire in the galley. And we, anyone who sails, anyone who's on a ship knows that if you have a fire in the galley, uh, you, you want to deal with it uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the, the challenge is, as I was reading, one commentator has said, is that this may be a species-defining problem, i.e. the way we care for our old and the way we provide for our young is absolutely defining of all species on the planet. And the sheer quantum of the numbers are scary. Uh, by 2050, this problem is about $100 trillion. I mean, it's hard to even fathom or compute the numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right the way back and just start in the UK and FTSE 350 because the numbers are only billions of pounds rather than trillions of dollars. And I'm just going to build up, building block by building block, so you can just see uh, the, the, the magnitude uh, of the challenge we face. And, and for me in the UK, it began 10 years ago with with the pension regulator, and actually uh, they produced a fantastic report, uh, the Pensions Regulator Scheme Funding Statistics. They looked at every valuation of every, every pension fund in the UK over the last 10 years by size, by members, and all the rest. And in 2005, good news, the UK was 84% funded, and the average recovery plan was nine years, which meant 2014, we'd all be fully funded. Unfortunately, we remain 84% funded, but that deficit in pounds is now a big old number. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. And actually, recovery plans are now even longer. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit controversial and say that I'm prepared to bet a reasonable amount of money that I don't think pension funds are going to be recovered in the next 10 to 12 years. And there are a number of reasons why I, I think that will be the case. And hopefully we'll have time at the end for you to, to challenge my assertions. So if you haven't read it, Hans Robertson, uh, just a few weeks ago, produced a fantastic report uh, looking at the FTSE 350 uh, pension funds. And I wanted to take uh, some of their char charts. So they said, over the last 15 years, so since 2000, 500 billion pounds has been poured in. By the way, in 2015, that number was 50 billion pounds. It's been paid in in pension contributions. You all know it. You all sit around the room. You see the 50 million pounds, 150 million pounds, and so forth. And yet, our deficits have tripled to around 900 billion pounds. Now that's a controversial number, that's 900 billion pounds on a buyout basis. The number we're probably more familiar with is about 300 billion pounds uh, on, on, on a PPF basis. And, and this is really the crux of the problem. How do we value and how do we cost pension funds? And there's a big difference between those two numbers. And, and when those things get out of whack, as they do, uh, it can become an almost impossible mountain to climb. So here's that chart. So you can see pensions contributions in 2000 were about 15, uh, were about 15 billion. You can see in 2014 they were about 50 billion pounds. And then you can see the chart going up showing the buyout deficit in billions of pounds. Now the question is, 
can our FTSE 350 corporates continue to pay out this amount of money when the percentage of active members in their pension funds is almost nil? You know, it was easy to do that back in 2005 when the CEO, the CFO, everyone you sat next to was in the company. But you know, how achievable is that in 2015? This is on a forward-looking basis. So right now, FTSE 350 schemes are paying out 13 billion a year more than pensions in payment. So they get, they're paying money out and they're paying money in, but they're paying 13 billion pounds out more. So that basically means pensions in payment is about 63, maybe 60 billion pounds. That difference goes up to 50 billion by 2030, which is not that far away. 15 years, as I've just realized, goes like that. Uh, and so that number goes to 50 billion. And that's a problem because today, 50% of pension schemes, other than those FTSE 350, are already cash flow negative. And yet only 12 out of the whole FTSE 350, only 12 pension schemes, so 4%, see that as an issue. This issue of the fact that there's gonna be uh, negative cash flows by 2030. What that means is that this notion of path dependency is a real risk. And I've got to say, path dependency isn't a risk that's really discussed or evaluated in many pension schemes. Many pension schemes might look at investment risk and volatility and value at risk, but it doesn't pick up the sequence of investment returns and just how important that is when you have negative cash flows. So they analyze, this is their chart, there are three reasons why this has happened, three big bets. Uh, assets haven't done what we thought they'd do. Rates have gone the opposite way than we thought we would, and people are living longer. So let's look at that. Back in 2000, scheme actuaries were predicted, if you had 100 million pounds and you invested it in equities, don't worry, 2015, you'd have 400 million pounds. By the way, actuaries in 2000, many of you, I won't name the actuaries, but if you speak to them, that's the way your pension fund was valued in 2000. So guess what? We built, got out our calculator, valued our liabilities, and said, don't worry, set aside 100, and it'll be worth 400. You can see that the UK total return is only half that number. Many pension funds were invested in equities, and only more recently, we begin to divest out of the UK into the US. So you can see that UK has underperformed the US. The next slide is gonna make me unpopular with about 15% of the room, but active management hasn't delivered. Doesn't matter on what, this is in the US, but basically, percent of actively managed funds outperformed by the benchmark. That's the wrong way around. And basically, it's 80% uh, of fund managers are not beating the benchmark. So equities haven't delivered, UK equities haven't delivered as much as, let's say, US. Uh, active management hasn't delivered. Some even diversified into hedge funds. And when they did, it was probably about here, when they were looking back at these returns. And this is from The Economist, and you can see what's happened to hedge fund returns since. But despite that, assets have grown from about 750 to 1.2 trillion. I mean, that's a big chunk of money. I mean, uh, it supports an entire ecosystem. So that's the asset side of the equation. So let's look at what's happened to the liabilities. That was the forward curve in 2000. Now what's amazing is that back in 2000, people thought an inverted yield curve was mad. I remember lots of people when I started at Deutsche Bank saying it doesn't make any sense to have an inverted yield curve. And yet actually that's been a pretty good predictor of what's happened. Unfortunately, the shift down in these curves means that the present value of those liabilities has just skyrocketed. In fact, liabilities have shot up 50% in just the last five years as that yield curve has gone from there to there. It also turns out we're not very good at forecasting or predicting real yields. So we have our valuation and we will have a view on what they are, but this is just Wall Street economists. Uh, and basically this is saying that they systematically uh, overestimate 10-year yields, so 60 basis points too high uh, on average over this, uh, over this period. Which is why we find ourselves where we are. So the assets have done very well, but this is the PPF liabilities. Remember they're capped out, they're much smaller, you can see that that's now about a 300 billion pound gap. And a lot of that move has come from the fall in real yields. And then let's look at the third part, people are living longer. And again, you can see in 2000, people were forecast to live about 80 years. And then slowly life expectancy has been pushed out so that about 2015 was sort of 83 and a half 
84. So I thought, well, that's where we are, a beautiful oil tanker has got a fire and somehow we didn't manage to put the fire out quick enough. But what I wanted to do is go back and do some sort of actuarial building blocks and say, how did we get to where we got here? So this is my 35-year-old man and said, how do you calculate a cost of accrual? So this is what your scheme actually would have done. So in 2000, you'd have taken that 35-year-old male and predicted out to 65 and made a payment and based on his life expectancy, come up with a cash flow. So I'm not looking at discounting, I'm just trying to understand what's happened to that cash flow due to changes in inflation and changes in longevity. And so you can see that that cash flow profile has increased by longevity and then by inflation. Now the inflation looks worse than it is. It's actually, it's a bit like an area of a rectangle. The problem is, is that inflation and longevity, they're not additive, they're sort of, I can't even say the word multiplicative, but you, you need to multiply the two and the area gets uh, a, a lot bigger. So the, the sum of cash flows that will be paid out to the 35 year old uh, has grown substantively. Now, what, what are the, some of the sort of numbers and factors that I've used in this? And what's interesting is that in the beginning, it was really inflation going up, that was the core cool driver. And you can see that actually, long-end guilt rates didn't really change. It's only really been in the last five years that long-end guilt rates in terms of the present value effect have really started to kick in. We've seen longevity has really kicked in, you know, five-year improvement uh, for the medium age of death for 35-year-olds. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to look at the, the, the sort of pension of cash flow uh, using the same methodology. So what I've done is I said, well, what was the cost of accrual of that 35-year-old male using a T, uh, a technical provisions basis of guilt plus 250. So that's the amount of cash you would set aside to promise that benefit. What was the true cost if you priced it on a guilt flat basis and how's that changed over time? So in 2000, if you'd taken that cash flow profile and discounted it at the then prevalent guilt rate and added 2.5%, which is probably what most of you in this room have done, you'd have set aside 11%. That was your cost of withdrawal. Now, actually, at that point in time, if you valued it correctly, or if you, sorry, and this, I know this is probably the controversial price of the valuation of liabilities versus cost. The cost on a guilt flat basis, i.e. the cost of not making that 2.5% over guilts was 29%. Unfortunately, if you fast forward to today, even at a guilt plus 250 basis, that cost of accrual is 32%. That's why many companies are now closing to future accrual. Again, in the same report, Hyman's are basically saying in the next few years, all 50 50 companies will be closing their pension fund to future accrual. When in fact, the guilt flat cost is 96%. This is challenging in public pensions because many public pensions are using this as a funding methodology. I was reading one annual report of a London borough pension fund, and they're saying, good news, we're funding our pension fund because we're still open. Uh, and, and we're going to use that and we're going to sort of average it out and, and over the next 15 years we'll fully fund it. But unfortunately, they're granting benefits even on a care basis or the rest using a guilt plus 2.5% basis. And so if it doesn't deliver that 2.5%, the true cost will be more like 96%. And I think this is the real cause of that fire in the galley. Let's just look at the attribution. How did we go from 10.6 to uh, 32%? A big part has been the fall in nominal discount rates. A little part to inflation and a little bit to longevity. But that's not the whole factor. Actually, you can see that a big chunk is really this combination, and it's really the combination of the inflation and mortality. It's that sort of cross product of people living longer and inflation really uh, increasing the cash flows. 30 years later, here he is, 65, uh, enjoying the beach. Uh, what, what was the annuity uh, like in 2000? So this is that same cash flow projection using 2000 mortality tables, using 2000 guilt rates, 2000 inflation. Actually, the story isn't as bad as you might expect. The problem with the 35 year old male is that you're projecting forward for 30 years and then another effectively sort of 20 years. Okay, there's the, the marginal impact of longevity has probably been greater, but the total impact has been less pronounced. 
And if we look at the annuity factor, and again, this is not, I'm not going to say this is the cost of an annuity, but this is just sort of pricing an annuity using those same guilt rates, that same inflation, same longevity. Basically, £15 bought you £1 of income until you died. That's really what that was saying in 2000. And look, it's gone up to about 23, 24. So it has been an increase, but nothing like as pronounced as that cost of accrual uh, of the 35-year-old male. Again, you can see falling guilt rates because actually you can see that longevity as a percentage uh, is bigger and then the combination less pronounced as it was uh, in uh, the 35-year-old male. So really, this far in the galley is much more a function of the cost of accrual uh, and, and correctly valuing pricing those liabilities. I want to zoom out and go, well, what does this mean for the UK? What does this mean for Europe? And so, and by the way, it's so hard to get hold of data. This is the scary thing. So this is an ONS report in 2012. It has not been updated since 2012. You can see private sector pensions, 1.7 trillion. But this is scary, unfunded liabilities of 4.8 trillion. I've done some back of the fag packet arithmetic, and I think if you were updating it today, that number would be over 10 trillion pounds. And these are enormous numbers. I mean, if anyone's seen the visualization of QE, if you took all the 20 pound notes and stacked them up in Palace and put it into Twickenham Stadium, that might get you a trillion pounds. So there's 10 Twickenham stadiums full of 20 pound notes. I mean, it's just an insane amount of money that needs to be financed from somewhere. Well, what about Europe? By the way, this chart shows the cost of pensions as a percentage of GDP. And this is not based on any kind of guilt flat methodology. This is based on an actuarial one. Uh, so you can see some pretty, some pretty scary numbers. But let's zoom into our friends, <coughs> Germany. Uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, Lufthansa announced that their pensions liabilities have gone up by 41%. So let's look at what that means for the DAT. So this was in the FTSE, uh, uh, in the FT a few, uh, a few weeks ago. You can see that the, the uh, deficit in 2008 was only 100 billion euros. This is just for 30 companies, by the way. It's gone from 100 billion to 200 billion. And the funding ratio has gone from 65% to 55%. And if we updated that today, that would be even lower. That would be down at 50%. So it's not just a UK problem. It's not just a corporate problem. Uh, it's a European problem. Now let's look at our friends, the US. Now this is an out-of-date chart because it shows Illinois at about 54. Illinois is the bad boy uh, of US state pension funds, as is Rhode Island. Any of these in white are probably states you shouldn't consider moving to live in if you are a taxpayer, and I'll explain why in a moment. The numbers start to get awfully big. I, I saw this cartoon and I thought it was a, a good sense uh, of, of, of what's coming. It really is, I know I'm mixing my metaphor, tsunamis and burning ships, but uh, uh, let's, let's look at the numbers. So this is from the state budget solutions. This is very live. Uh, California. That's to cost 754 billion just to be financed. Alaska, this is per capita, $40,000 per capita that needs to be financed. And our good friend, Illinois, is about 22% funded. They claim they're about 50% funded, but we're going to look at how they value their liabilities, a little bit of actuarial uh, maths in a moment. And uh, Fred talked about this. So this is a chart for Wiltshire Consulting and saying, look at the top 131 state pension plans that have got two and a half trillion to three trillion dollars in assets, and let's look at their funding levels. So between sort of 70 and 80 uh, percent. But what I don't know if everyone knows, but in the US, the way it works is as a, as a sort of investment committee or a trustee board, you say, what rate of return do we think we can make over the next 15 to 20 years? Seven, eight. 9%, and then you can use that number to then discount your liabilities, and then you come up with your funding level. Even using 8%, they're coming up with this kind of valuation. Now what's scary, so this is the median actuarial valuation rate for those 131 plans, so 7.65, so you can see evenly spread between about 7.5 and 8. And then this is Wiltshire using their expected return numbers, 
And they've taken those same 131 plans and just done a scatter plot. So based on your strategic asset allocation of equities and bonds and real estate, our Wiltshire expected returns, this is what we think all 131 state plans. And by the way, the median expected return of those strategic asset allocations is 6%. So what if I take 5% and say, well, what if we value these liabilities at 5%? I won't go to Gilt's flat, I won't go to US Treasury flat, I'll just take a very easy to be 5%. This is the funding ratio, and I could only get the data to 2011, 2012, so this is the same pension funds discounted at 5%, 68%, 50%. Today, it will be down at 45%. That's why Illinois is at 22%. When you start doing the arithmetic, on the amount of tax that has to be paid if you live in these states just to pay for yesterday's benefits. The prospect for young people in these states is, 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 pretty, is pretty frightening. So same state budget solution, so 2.6 trillion, that's what they think they're worth using this sort of 7.65% discount rate, but using a 5% discount rate, this number uh, is more like 6.7 6 trillion. So that's 4 trillion, uh, about dollars of unfunded liabilities. And I'm not talking about Medicare or anything else. This is just state uh, pension plans. The expected return on equities to get out of this needs to be above 10% for the next 30 years. Bridgewater did an analysis uh, a few months ago uh, that basically says if, if we get 4% return on assets for the next sort of 15, 20 years, 85% of state pension plans will be bust will have run out of money. For them to make it, basically, they need to be making a 10% compound annual growth rate consistently for the next 15, 20 years. So, unfortunately, I think the US looks like that. It's really got out of hand. I suppose to ask a question back to you, and I, I quote JFK here, if not us, who? If not now, when? Because as I said right at the beginning, I think this is a problem that threatens our planet and threatens us as a species and has serious intergenerational impacts and we really need to get our hands around it. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you Rob. Why don't we take some, some questions, some pretty startling stuff in there. and. Uh, Let's see if anyone's got a question that uh, Rob can deal with. Hmm. Just uh, say who you are, where you come from, if you would. David Morley from Eaton Banks. It's just a quick question about um, UK public sector unfunded liabilities, so the civil service teachers, firemen, and so on, which is 0% uh, funded. And how, how big an issue is that, and what do we need to, what do we need to start to do to fill that gap? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was the one in the ONS chart, which was that 4.8 trillion of unfunded uh, liabilities. I think the, the reality is, is that uh, a promise was granted that is just completely unaffordable. And actually, there are horrible uh, knock-on effects. So not only are we going to sort of give our junior doctors a hard time, but basically, if you're a doctor in 55, you're pretty wealthy. If you've got a final salary pension fund, many of these doctors might even have a million pounds, over a million pounds in, in salary, or in, 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 in final salary benefits. I mean, th this is, I think, the challenge, because I, it requires a massive restructuring. It's a bit like Philip was talking about. We, we basically, we've proven that we weren't able to grow our way out. We gave out these pensions basically saying, we can grow our way out, and we haven't. And you know, I haven't even thrown in you know, what Philip was saying about forward-looking expected returns, his lock, and, and everything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're beginning to see it in the corporate sector where liability management, which you know five years ago was considered, will do that. You know, that would be the last thing that we do, and now that's being seen as part of the toolkit to sort of get this thing down. Is that I think if we're going to get these these unfunded liabilities down uh, in an affordable way, we probably need to restructure them much more than was proposed in the Turner report. Uh, in a way, that's the problem. You know, it's not that we weren't told. In 2004, we were told by Dare Turner. In 2010-11, we were told by Lord Hutton, and no one asked too far, and it's too drastic. But when we don't grasp something like this, it is literally like a fire in a galley. It just, it, it runs away from us. Uh, 
Uh, Paul Trickett from uh, Railpen. Rob, I, I know that you give a lot of thought to long-term trends. It, it strikes me that, that this one, in many ways, has got lots of similarities to climate change, the long-term trend. It's very difficult to get short-term political yeah. momentum to, uh, to address the problem because voters vote in the short term. Uh, so, you know, if we accept that the, the promise is not going to be capable of being met, which I completely agree with you about, uh, in the corporate world, I can see DB to DC transfers being a very popular way of trying to reduce liability now. And going into the PPF gives us the framework for, for closing off benefits because we don't have to pay 90%, we can, we can go less. But what would your view be on how we create a, a sort of public policy framework that allows some of the public sector liability issues to be dealt with? What, what can be done that's practical? Right now? Great, great question. I think. When I said about putting this presentation together, I just thought I'd gather all the stuff I've read. So all I've done is gathered all the sort of emails that come into your inbox and the articles that you sort of hear them, and I just sort of collated them. And so I got a little bit depressed putting this presentation together because I thought, you know, I just hang it, uh, hang it all together. Uh, and uh, yeah, and as, as I as I was sort of assembling it, I thought, okay, that's quite a big picture. And I think your analogy of climate change uh, is, is, is a good one. Uh, I think. Moving to a DC framework for where we're getting people to save a minimum of 15% and giving people access to good quality, low cost default frames and changing people's expectations about where they retire. The idea that you work for 40 years and then sort of live and you finance that bit off that is, is I think, is a concept that we can't hold on to uh, and, and, any longer. So I think get people to save early get people, maybe not 15% to begin with, but help them get up to 15%, so maybe by the time they're sort of 35 to 40, and then maintain that rate, and you know, I think people are gonna to have to expect to work until they're sort of 75. Now, will there be work for 75 year olds? I think we need to, as a culture and organization, change the way we, we, we think about working patterns. So I think it's so interlinked, because there's, unfortunately there's a whole load of beliefs about I work and then I retire, and organizations think, well, I can retire off my workforce, it's just a cheap way to lay them off. Uh, there are all these things that we've done over the last 20 years, which is where we, we are. We've somehow got to undo uh, that, that mental assessment. In Australia, uh, you know, many people are going back to work. Uber drivers are often in their 80s because they can't find a, an income. I was speaking to someone who wants to set up a charity to teach sort of older people how to make use of their, their, their sort of assets or their skills to go, go back and try and you know, earn an income uh, while, whilst they're, they're in retirement. Uh, but yeah, I, I, my view and our response to the HMT consultation was that we need to get the savings ratio up to 15% uh, as quickly as possible. That, that was probably our clearest, clearest message. And if you did that, you'd ensure that the vast majority of people would be below the poverty line in retirement, which was our kind of stated objective. Just, Jim, just to um, make this uh, observation, which, which is that I do wonder, well, I don't know what you think, I don't know what anyone else thinks about this, whether the Chancellor, when he sees these numbers, and you have to think that someone somewhere must be looking at it, even if they don't have the full picture, they've got some inkling that there's a fire burning somewhere. I wonder whether there's going to be a temptation that's going to be too difficult to resist to make some major change in the budget, the like of which we haven't seen, which will involve bringing those numbers down by virtue of changing some of the benefits and, I don't know, stripping out inflation or capping it or doing something fairly objective. You're shaking your head in there, you think not? I, I, think, I, I think it's political suicide. I was going to ask that question to Rob, but uh, uh, you know, you've already responded to it. You know, what do we do with this? And the challenge is, I can't see any politicians making those sort of short-term, difficult decisions that they should be making. You know, these are long-term issues, and they're dealing with very short-term uh, challenges, really. They're not looking at it properly that way. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I agree, Rob, thanks. Uh, I agree we need to increase our saving rate, and um, uh, if we move it up from whatever it is now to 15%, what, what does I mean, one of the common objections to that is what that does to the economy, Correct. sort of the paradox of thrift, I think the economists call it. Have you got any comments on that? 
Well, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, I think what we've done is you, we've deferred a problem, but at what point do you go time out? I think, unfortunately, it doesn't really affect anyone in this room. Who it affects is our children and your grandchildren. And at what point do you go time out? I think that's why the climate change is, is a good example and go, we're not going to pass this burden on to a generation. This problem won't hit until about 2050. And some of you have maybe, that I gave a talk at the NAPF, I was talking about trying to get young people to say it, but I, I, I did a parody of the, the Hunger Games, and I called it the Retirement Games, but I have a vision of the future where, you know, in 20, you know, 2050, people in the DC district are sort of rounded up and they have to fight and the winner gets their pension. But I mean, obviously there's a reason people make these movies. Uh, and I think that, 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 is, that is the challenge that we, that we face. You could escalate, you don't need to go to 15% overnight and actually uh, th there's a lot of behavioral psychology in this which is I've just started reading a book called strategy and the fat smoker which is about why is it that we all have come up with great strategies strategy is easy but implementing it is so hard and it was written by a guy uh, David Meister who basically was overweight and smoked and then took drastic action when he basically found out he was almost going to die and then he was like okay right I'm going to cut you know I'm going to my diet I'm going to exercise I'm going to give up smoking and, but he makes the point that we've got to break these almost impossible tasks down into really small salami slices. So Alcoholics Anonymous, you don't sign up and say, I'm never going to drink alcohol for the rest of my life. That's too hard a promise to keep. You say, I'm not going to drink alcohol today. Now, hopefully you keep that promise every day. And so I think using that same analogy, you know, we could flight plan our way from 8% to 15%, you know, over the next 10 to 15 years. But what if we had put a policy in place that says by 2025, we'd like our savings ratio to be 15%. And we know that. The Australian politicians were all saying, if only we'd push the savings ratio up from 9% to 15%. So copy-paste, 20 years ago, 1995, they knew the right answer was 15. They got enough political will to get it up to 9%, and they couldn't get it up to 15 but they could have easily said, we'll try and get it up to 15% 20 years from now. We'll just do half a percent a year. And that's it. Like changing the state retirement age. Just graduate it so that it doesn't impact anyone in, in, any, particular, in any particular year. But it requires that commitment today. Excuse me, I've just got two questions. One is um, back to the economy. If you have a savings rate of 15%, however you do it, you'll be coming like Japan. And you've got to remember that when you're thinking about um, the economy in general. The other one is, is a shorter term issue, which is you have a, a huge demand, three times as much as supply in indexing goods, as far as I understand it. I can never understand, I know there's an inflation aspect to this, why the government doesn't issue much more indexing goods. Well, but we already think they're borrowing too much, so... No, no, I mean, but they have to fund the deficit inside. Oh, yeah, I mean, to be fair, I mean, over the last five, six years, the proportion of indexing gilts that the DMO issues has been issuing more and more DMO... Sorry, it's been issuing more and more indexing gilts and long-dated indexing gilts. Yeah, but as a percentage of the total bond market, it's tiny. Yeah, but, that, but that's just the sheer... So as a percentage of the liabilities, it's tiny. As a percent of the DMO has, as a percentage of the amount it borrows, has been restructuring its debt from short-rated fixed to longer-dated inflation. So I remember the DMO... Just so I'm clear about it, I don't know the numbers exactly, but it's still a percentage of issuance. It's still quite small. Yeah, well, but that's because the problem is so vast. It's not... The, you know, the, we've got two trillion of liabilities, and they're only needing to sort of have you know, 350 billion, 400 billion to finance. Uh, within that 400 billion, they have shifted it from more fixed to more long dated. And, but it's not going to take it up to uh, you know, several trillion, which is why I think some of the people in this room, whether it's the infrastructure or the lifetime mortgages or the rest, are trying to say, what are alternative ways of finding long dated inflation and cash flows that we can use to, to get this? Because if you can make gilts plus two and a half, inflation link, then obviously the numbers work. There doesn't seem much we can do. 
<laughs> well, really, realistically, because I think it's a very nice idea of going to savings rates of 15%, but the impact on the economy in terms of spending will be considerable, and therefore your, your, your growth rate goes down. You know, I mean, it doesn't work, so I'm trying to say to you. But the issue is whether it's a short-term problem or a long-term problem. But if we don't take the past the metal and we don't take the pain. Sorry, I'm just saying, if we're not grasping any metal, so we're not taking any pain. So by not grasping a metal now, we're deferring a pain for future generations. The reality is we just can't afford that gap. And whatever returns we're getting is not going to close the gap. So drastic action has to be taken in terms of pension schemes, refining the benefits that people have been promised. They won't do it. Um, but it's, it's like rescheduling debt, you know. Yeah. We've just rescheduled well, Greek's death, but we, we know that Greece is going to default in a few years' time. And we're just not grasping the nettle. So the question is, and the problem within this really states is we have a political spectrum that people aren't going to, they can't see it. If you can't see something, they're not going to do anything about it. These, these are promising earth benefits, aren't they? I mean, you can't change them. Well, but, but let's say just let's take it back to the FTSE 350, where I think we can do something. So I've probably taken it macro and, and sort of made it all. But take it back to the FTSE 350. I think something can be done now to stop it being a problem in 2030. I think unless something does get done that's different to the way we got to where we got to, those FTSE 350 will be in, 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 in big trouble. The fact that only sort of 4% are even worried or thinking about that sort of cash flow negativity is, I, I think is, is an issue. The problem is as well, that, that 900 billion pound buyout deficit number that Hyman's gave, that's the same as everyone's combined salary in the UK in 2015. So everybody in the UK, if you took everyone's salary in the UK, you wouldn't have been able to pay off the pension deficit in 2015. I mean, that, well, on a buyout basis, not on a, not on a sort of TP funding basics. I mean, yeah, that's the numbers are the numbers are big. I I think the FTSE 350 problem is a containable problem. Uh, the you know how we restructure state UK state benefits, the unfunded liabilities. How do we pay for that? That becomes an issue. And and the challenge is the chart that Philip Coggan showed, showing the fact that uh, I can't remember what date it was, but it was at a date in some point in the future. Let's call it 2030. Basically, 50% of people in Europe will be over 65. So if you look at the percentage of 65-year-olds as a percentage of the uh, 18 to 64-year-olds, that will hit 50%. So you, you, you have a real uh, dependency ratio issue. And th this is just basic sort of demographics. In, back in you know, the early 1900s, 1910, 1906, when pensions came into place, the dependency ratio was nine, nine to one. Nine workers for one person retiring. It's gone to three to one, and it will go to two to one, and it will just, and it will keep going. And when it gets to one to one, it will be an unaffordable promise. Rob, Andrew, Swan, Emma G. Um, I, I wonder whether we're just forgetting a bit of human resourcefulness here as well, in that, you know, we're living longer. Uh, I can't think of anything worse than retiring for 25 years. And that, you know, whilst there is, I think, some political problems in pushing up retirement uh, ages, and, and as you were alluding to there, when people used to retire, I think the average age, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when people retired, it was they'd live for another six years. I think we're forgetting that people might not want to retire. People are healthier, uh, they're, they're living longer. Let's have some of that champagne. <laughs> um, and, and they will work and there will be jobs. We saw from, from Philip that you know, the, the, the workforce is, is falling. Um, I think people will be resourceful and they want to work for longer. I, I, that would definitely, if people, A, work, every year people work longer, they're saving more and they've got another year's worth of investment. So it doesn't, you don't have to keep, you don't have to move it by more than a few years. You get a double whammy effect because let's say you move it by five years, you've got five years more of saving, five years more of investment, and then five years less of drawdown. So it, actually shifting it by five years has a transformative effect. I mean, we saw what happened in sort of France and Greece you know, just two, three years ago, but I think that, that's, a, that, that's a, a much easier lever to move. Paul Trickett again. Retired age 55. <laughs> um, so, so, so not a great example to anybody, I think. 
Um, I, 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 I sort of, I can see how we can address the problem that, that we're talking about in relation to corporate pension provision. Uh, and a lot of what we're talking about you know, might, might work through in time. I'm still, I still struggle a lot with the, the public sector unfunded elements, so indeed even the funded elements of the, of the public sector. And when I, I look at the, the triple lock in relation to state benefits, and, and you see what a huge transferring wealth that's been over the last few years from a younger generation to an older generation, largely as far as I can make out, simply because the older generation vote more and tends to vote Tory. It just looks so unsustainable that I can't, I can't imagine any Tory politician Turning it, having the guts to turn it round. And we had a, we we just we've got an ex pensions minister come tomorrow who, who, in the end, knew quite a lot about pensions. We've got a pensions minister now who probably knows more about pensions than, than any pensions minister we ever have. But all the power seems to have left the DSS and it's gone to the treasury, and uh, and that makes me wonder who, who on earth is going to address this. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think the point Dad was making is, as I was trying to pull these, what's frightening is how hard it is to get hold of any good data or statistics. You saw how out of date the US and the UK data is. I'm not sure anyone really has a sense of how big this far in the galley is. I mean, people know it's a far, but they think it's, 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 like it's containable. It, five, we can go another five years, someone will put it out in five years' time. It's not on our watch. That, as I was pulling this together, I just wondered who, who actually knows how bad these numbers are, uh, because I, I, I don't think they do. And I think once you get a sense of how bad the problem is, then you, then you probably take it. But you know, why would you, as you say, from a voting perspective, from voting tactics, you wouldn't ever go with a policy that tried to address it. It's, it's only if you had a voting population that really signed up for doing the right thing in the long term at the expense of things in the short term. John Preston from the PwC uh, Pension Fund. Uh, I'm conscious this is a very depressing discussion. Um, I'm going to make it worse. Um, because I agree with you, Rob, I think the first 350 one is difficult but manageable. The public sector one, of course, it's actually much worse than we're talking about because we're, starting, we're just talking about the pension problem. There's actually a huge number of other promises that politicians in Western governments have made, and if you take the United States, you put up some terrifying numbers, but that sort of starts from the assumption they're solvent today. Actually, 49 of the 50 states are technically bankrupt today, as is the federal government, if people were prepared to keep lending it money. So my concern, and I don't have an answer, is that I don't think there is any chance of politicians changing this, but that's our fault. Because it, I don't think it's that the numbers don't exist. Actually, I think the numbers do exist. And I don't think it's that people don't get it. I think people do get it. They don't want to get it. I mean, in the time again, you, you see discussions where actually people are prepared to accept easy solutions, which politicians and others want to sell them, because people will go, yes, that's right. Uh, my fear is that we're not going to get there until we get to that burning platform. I mean, the fire's there, but people don't want to see it. And I think we're going to have to get much closer to disaster before people are going to start to bite that bullet. That's scary, but I'm afraid I think that's where we are. Can I just say one thing, actually? Rob, I was going to sort of say something along those lines, but more directly, in fact. I think the burning platform is very real, but we see it in this audience. I think what you've got to do now is get on news at 10 and on the television actually start giving this presentation to the masses. I think we've got to simplify and deliver this message to the masses. It's not getting out there, and the politicians will not react until it actually is out there as a message. So our goal, message <laughs> delivered, right? You've got to do it again in a different style, you know, much larger audience. Thank you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, man. No pressure. <laughs> Chris. Chris Hogg, Roll Trustee. Robert, I thought that was an excellent presentation and really, really powerful, actually. Um, and David, I think you raise a very interesting point. And, and for me, just thinking this through to any sort of logical conclusion, it's quite hard to imagine that without that very difficult question being asked, um, presumably somewhere in the world first, and then possibly spreading 
Um, to the, the most recent comment, I think it was in, uh, it would have been March 2014 at the NEPF investment conference, Danny Alexander stood and claimed to have saved a huge amount of money for the UK taxpayer by making some changes to government pension schemes. And actually, what he'd probably done is cost the UK taxpayer an incredible amount of money because they locked into those arrangements for so many years. And it's quite incredible that a politician um, in his role at the time was able to even stand and make that statement at a pensions conference. So I don't, I don't think people do know these numbers actually. I think they've been hidden well away um, up to now. And for me, I think, again, if you roll forward, you can imagine a period maybe 20 years away where there are enough people who by that time have grey hair and are voters that realise their predicament that at, at some point, you know, this, this would be addressed. It would have become at that stage a short-term issue for politicians. And I guess the, it's almost like a measure of success, um, perhaps for uh, people in the industry at the moment is, if that's 20 years away, how, how far can we bring that forward by having that issue addressed sooner than later, basically? I mean, I think this is all the all the issues that we've been talking about. I'm, I'm borrowing, taking on David's issue about the impact on the economy. I think that's that's it. And I think Indus' point is it's only by making it understandable to everyone in a kind of in a way that's digestible, so that people go, "Hang on a minute, I don't I don't want to be in this situation." That anything will be done about it. I agree with you. I still don't believe that politicians really understand compound maths. You know, what's the difference of discounting at 8% versus 5% versus 4%? And really, 1%, 2%, does it really make that much of a difference? That's the problem. You know, 1 or 2% over 45, 50, 60 years is a huge difference. And I think people people don't realise that. Uh, and I think it goes back to the ability to visualise the problem in a way that it's easy to understand and for people to digest and go, okay, that's worrying enough that, that, that we want to take action and do something about this. You need to wrap. I just, maybe just by way of uh, closing, closing comment, I, I said earlier that I started spending much, much more time in the long-term care space and I was in Gothenburg a couple of weeks ago giving a talk on funding long-term care, which is sort of where pensions and actually takes you, because that's what you're going to be spending a lot of your pension on. And all sort of fondly imagine you're going to be skiing and seeing the kids in, uh, uh, in, in, in Dorset, but actually you're going to be spending it, a huge amount of it probably on your long-term care. And we don't spend a lot of time, or you don't spend a lot of time with carers, but I was in a very similar uh, uh, seminar or session with people who are in the caring space. And the thing about carers is that they really care. They've all got a story. They've all got the children with, 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 with um, some long-term chronic illness or a parent. They're all carers and they care. And these guys were all in tears. I mean, not all in tears, but I mean, a lot of them were really upset about the lack of funding in their, in their space. And it's actually, when you see that, you realize it's a joined up problem. You have the whole pensions issue, but then there's this enormous burgeoning, spiraling care, long-term care issue. It's the front of every, the Daily Mail has this every day. And if you get poor long-term care, guess what? You end up in the NHS, and that is really bad. That's blowing up as well. So if you are Greg Harris, who's Chief Secretary to the Treasury and reports directly to George Osborne, he actually doesn't see pensions by itself and the deficit in, in the NHS, which, by the way, is £470 billion, pounds, which no one's talking about on a guilt fat basis, because that's kind of, they describe it as that's pay as you go. £470 billion, that's half the entire number, just the NHS. What Greg Hans is looking at is pensions, long-term care, and the NHS, and everyone's screaming. So he watched his consumer spending review on the 25th of November when he somehow got to start juggling the, you know, things around and making some hard decisions. And uh, it's going to be fascinating. There's one school of thought that says, for the first time, you've got a politician, George Osborne, who, and David Cameron, who wants a legacy of some description, presumably he's checking out at the end of this, 
we might for the first time be, be emboldened to make some brave decisions. We'll see what it looks like in March. It won't be anything like you know, what's actually necessary, but you might be, you know, you might, might be surprised. So um, who knows? But uh, what a great, great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Brian, help us with some uh, what we're going to do now. Okay, so on a slightly lighter note,